Let us worship God. Let us seek God's face by singing from Psalm 79. We'll sing verses 9 to 13. This is the latter part of Psalm 79. The tune is French, which is tune number 64. Tune number 64. Psalm 79, beginning at verse 9. For thy name's glory, help us, Lord. Who hast our Savior been? Deliver us for thy name's sake, O purge away our sin. We're conscious here that uh, the forgiveness and cleansing of our sins is not just all about us and the benefit that we receive, but it is about the glory that is brought to God's own name uh, through this. So let's sing verses 9 to 13. seek God's face together in prayer. (coughs) Almighty and ever-blessed God in heaven, we give our praise unto your great name this day in anticipation of offering that same praise and much more for all of eternity. It is our great joy in this world to have fellowship and communion with you, and it will be a joy inexpressible and full of glory, a perfect joy in the world to come, to spend our strength in the courts of heaven, in the worship and adoration of your great name. 
We acknowledge, O Lord, that you are a just and a holy God, that you reveal yourself as a consuming fire, that you are the judge of all the earth, that you will hold all uh, to account for every idle word uttered in the flesh, for every deed done in the body, and that you will work a just judgment, a righteous uh, verdict. We are conscious that while in this world uh, justice has fallen in the streets and we see injustice abounding on every side, distortion and overthrow of equity and of truth, we rejoice that our God reigns in heaven, that we have another king whose name is Jesus, who rules over all the affairs of men and who is bringing to pass that perfect will according to your own counsel. We pray, O God, that you would uh, give us uh, a quiet uh, confidence and refuge in your name, that we would be discontent to run anywhere, uh, to hide uh, anywhere else, but to find ourselves within uh, you as our refuge and our our strength. Uh, Surely, uh, to be covered with the blood of Jesus Uh, to be taken into union with he who is the Lamb of God uh, is the only safe and sure place for needy sinners. And you have promised us that there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And so you are both just and the justifier of the ungodly. And we would uh, rejoice this day that you are our God and our Savior. And we thank you, O Lord, that you have Uh, been pleased, as you did with the disciples of old, to speak uh, to your people and to say that they are no longer merely servants, but have been taken into friendship uh, with you. And what's more, you have been pleased to make them uh, the apple of your eye, the object of your love, and to include them in a kingdom which shall never end, never die. Grant, O Lord, that in the midst of crumbling uh, kingdoms all around us, that we would uh, bring ourselves consciously uh, to see our identity in that kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, which has endured and will endure uh, forever. We ask, O Lord, that you would uh, remember us in uh, all of our shortcomings, that you would be pleased to uh, give us fresh supplies of grace, that you would give the fresh application of the gospel uh, to our souls. Uh, We have uh, not served you as we ought. We have not sought first your kingdom and righteousness. Uh, We have broken this Uh, Sabbath. We have desecrated it with thought, words, and deeds. We stand in need, O Lord, every moment of every day of your grace, not only in upholding us, but in cleansing and and forgiving us for our many many faults against you. Uh, We ask, O Lord, that you would forgive us our sins and that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness that you would be pleased uh, to make us accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ and that we would find that quiet peace of conscience, uh, not in our own labors and efforts, but in the labors and perfect efforts of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We thank you that you have given to us uh, an authoritative Uh, a perfect, a pure word which you have sent in the Holy Scriptures without error, infallible, sufficient for all that we need for life and godliness, a word that brings the gospel message clearly home to our hearts. We thank you for the accompanying ministry of the Holy Spirit who inspired these scriptures and who illuminates the minds of your people to understand and apply them. And we ask that this word would Uh, be powerfully influential in shaping and molding us in this public worship service. Enable us, O Lord, to uh, not only mouth 
uh, words that are sung in praise, but to be conscious that these are the very words of God and that we need uh, these songs to be made our songs, uh, for them to be expressing our own souls, to be shaped by them. Uh, we need to make them the meditation of our, our hearts. We need to be given wisdom through the supply of these songs of Zion. And grant, O Lord, that you would make them powerfully at work in our hearts as the word of God, as the Lord's song. Uh, bless us as well as we read your word, uh, that it would not be with an idle mind, but that we would read attentively, reverently, uh, hungry and eager to be taught of the Lord. Bless us in the, the preaching of Holy Scripture and grant, Lord, that it would be uh, applied to our particular circumstances and need that you would carve off and give to each uh, the portion that we stand in need of uh, to be fed with the blessings which come down from heaven. All of which, O oh Lord, would, would, be, would be beyond our reach and which we could not claim or provide for ourselves. We need you to come and to set uh, food before us and to give us appetites and to feed us and satisfy and strengthen us. And so we wait upon you for your blessing, knowing that unless you build the house, they labor in vain who build it. Uh, we would be about a fool's errand were it not for your benediction and blessing to rest upon us in these ordinances. And so we wait upon you, O Lord, in expectation for your help and encouragement and strength. Uh, bless, we ask, the word of God as it goes forth in various pulpits throughout our city, uh, encourage uh, the hearts of faithful ministers as they seek to break open that word and to preach it with uh, a measure of, of ardency and, and uh, skillfulness. We pray that it would be fruitful uh, for those who hear. Bless again, we ask, this week before us. Bless the colloquium, and we ask that you would uh, own these labors that the uh, sessions which we participate in would be full of instruction and help. Bless the Presbytery meeting and grant, Lord, that it would be conducted in a way pleasing to you with deliberations and conclusions that are in accord with Holy Scripture. Bless, we ask the, the licensure service this Friday and we pray for uh, your servant who will be uh, a license to preach the gospel and may you pour out your Holy spirit upon him and give him every help, gifts, and grace to conduct his responsibilities with faithfulness. Uh, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would uh, be pleased to bless the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in distant places. We think of uh, the country of Russia, that vast, vast country, uh, which is populated by so many million uh, who speak the Russian tongue. We are thankful for the a way in which the gospel has taken root there, and we pray that it would spread like fire, that it would be accompanied with the work of reformation, that you would unseat uh, the strongholds of Russian orthodoxy, and that you would plant uh, ch true churches uh, in their place, which would herald uh, the good news of, of Christ crucified. Uh, we plead, O oh Lord, for the, the Russian government in Moscow and and ask that uh, the leaders there would be brought uh, to see the end of their uh, past sins and uh, the systems of, of uh, philosophy which have been um, so much against the truth of, of your word and grant that they would not run from one idol to another, but that they would see equally the bankruptcy of, of a, a decrepit and unbelieving uh, Western uh, countries countries as well. Grant, Lord, instead that they would be led into the truth and liberty of your light and law and the crown rights of King Jesus. And so we commend them to you. Bless those faithful churches there as they seek to preach Christ crucified and teach the whole counsel of, of God. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would especially encourage and strengthen the labors of our Dutch Reformed brethren that come over and help as they labor in, in parts of Russia and Eastern uh, Europe, that you, would, that you would prosper them in the distribution of Reformed literature and in equipping ministers and in planting churches. 
Uh, may all of this be given great, rich, uh, fruitful blessing in the days to come. And we wait upon you, O Lord, for uh, our own needs, the needs of our own souls, the consolation needed, the conviction needed, the strength that is must be needed, to, imparted to our souls to carry us forward in, in holiness. Uh, grant, Lord, that you would bless our office bearers, bless our elder and deacons, uh, encourage them in their labors, uh, may they see that their labor is not in vain in the Lord. Establish thou the work of their hands to them. Protect them, we pray, from all the assaults of the devil who would seek to ensnare, entice, and overthrow uh, them and to uh, scandalize the cause of, of Christ. We pray that they would be kept in your hand as a great refuge. Bless we pray the same of our other office bearers throughout the Presbytery denomination, other faithful churches uh, in this land and elsewhere. And we ask, O oh God, that you would uh, be pleased to, to bless us now as we wait upon you. We come actively seeking your face, asking, Lord, that you would remember us for good, asking that you would bring down blessing upon our souls, asking that you would feed us and strengthen us. And so hear the cries of your people as they are raised heavenward. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn our hearts again to the Lord in singing praise to him. We come in our consecutive singing through the Psalms to Psalm 119. We pick up where we left off this morning, which is at verse 129. Verses 129 to 136. And the tune is St. Bernard, which is number 107. Tune 107. Have you noted especially the last verse in this section, which says, Rivers of waters from mine eyes did run down when I saw how wicked men run on in sin and do not keep thy law. There may be a tendency with some of us to look at the lawlessness of our own nation and like nations and to be filled with indignation. And that is appropriate. But if we are to be biblical, it needs to be joined with tears. We must be broken uh, over the transgressions of the people as well as to be um, angered by them. So may the Lord work this into our own souls. Let's sing to his praise. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 129.
us worship God in the reading of his word. Our reading is found in the Old Testament book of Joshua, and we'll read together chapter 20. Joshua chapter 20. Let us hear the word of God. The Lord also spake unto Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you, uh, for you cities of refuge, whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer that killeth any person unawares and unwittingly may flee thither, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. And when he that doth flee unto one of those cities shall stand at the entering of the gate of the city and shall declare his cause in the ears of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city unto them and give him a place that he may dwell among them. And if the avenger of blood pursue after him, then they shall not deliver the slayer up into his hand, because he smote his neighbor unwittingly and hated him not before time. And he shall dwell in that city until he stand before the congregation for judgment and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days. Then shall the slayer return and come unto his own city and unto his own house, unto the city from whence he fled. And they appointed Kedesh in Galilee in Mount Naphtali and Shechem in Mount Ephraim and Kirjath Arba, which is Hebron, in the, mount, in the mountain of Judah. And on the other side, Jordan, by Jericho eastward, they assigned uh, Bezer and the wilderness upon the plain out of the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth and Gilead out of the tribe of Gad, and Golan and Bashan out of the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel, and for the stranger that sojourneth among them, that whosoever killeth any person at unawares might flee thither and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. Amen. God bless again the reading of his holy and inspired word. Let's continue to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, lifting up our voices and praise to him with the use of Psalm 119, verses 137 to 144. 137 to 144, the tune is Eric Stain, number 58. Tune number 58. Notice the reference to the purity of God's word in verse 140. Thy words most pure, therefore on it thy servant's love is set. Thy words most pure, therefore on it thy servant's love is set. Let's sing together verses 137 to 144.
Let's read together in God's Word from the New Testament book of Romans and chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience, experience, and experience, hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, As by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. By Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless the reading of his holy word. Let's turn our attention again this afternoon back to Joshua. And we come in our study to chapter 20, the book of Joshua, chapter 20. The chapter begins with these words. And the Lord also spake unto Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge, whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses. One of the things that we crave uh, in this world, 
but never are given in its fullness is, is justice. God has made us in his own image. We are not only rational creatures, we are moral creatures. The law is on our heart. We have an innate sense of right and wrong. And we often find ourselves desiring for wrongs to be righted, for justice to be upheld. But as we look to the right and as we look to the left, what we find in most generations is that justice has fallen in the streets that equity has been abandoned. And this has never been more so in our own country as in in the present day, when there is very little of any true biblically defined justice to be found at all. Court systems are absolutely shot with corruption and fraud and injustice. And we have felt it and seen it up close and personal, even within our own congregation. But we are thankful that that is not the whole story, is it? There is the living and true God who reigns in heaven, and he is a just God and a righteous Savior. And he rules and reigns over all the affairs of men, and there is a perfect meeting out of justice, and there is a perfect standard to which we can look in the pages of Holy Scripture, and there is a righting of all wrongs on the last day. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself will sit as judge over all the sons of men from Adam uh, to the last soul conceived prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there is justice. But you know, in all of this, we are conscious as redeemed sinners, those of us who know the Lord, that we speak about things with a little bit of fear and trepidation. Because we not only know society and the world at large, we know ourselves. We know the wrongs in our own heart and mind and the sins which have abounded. And we know that if we were left to ourselves, that justice visited upon us is unbearable for us to even consider, to reflect upon. But this is where the sweetness of the gospel comes in, isn't it? Because God does not stop being just in order to be merciful to his people. But his justice and his mercy meet in the cross of the Lord Jesus. And so we find mercy for us, not at the cost of Christ's justice, but in the full execution of that justice upon our substitute, the Lord Jesus. And so God presents himself in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament as a refuge for his people. We find ourselves running into a refuge so that we are shielded, protected from the execution of justice upon our own heads. We are hid in Christ. And thus he is both just and the justifier of the ungodly. Well, we come in our study of Joshua to chapter 20, and as you'll have noted in our reading a few moments ago, uh, this is a description of Uh, the cities of refuge. This had been laid out in the law, as we'll note more in a minute, and now it is being implemented. It had been prescribed generations before. The Lord had laid out for them clear instructions about this, and now, at long last, they have reached their rest, their land of promise, and they are implementing the divine provisions that God has given in the appointment of cities of refuge. So that's where we focus our attention this afternoon. And there are a few things that we'll note. First of all, the supply of justice. The supply of justice. We're thinking under this theme of the refuge of justice. Justice itself is a refuge. And we see, first of all, the supply of justice. So here, The Lord is laying out the appointment of the tribes. We've covered that now for several chapters. We've concluded that. And now he begins to turn to the Levites, who are last of all, and next week, God willing, or rather two weeks uh, from today, we'll have a, a visiting minister next week. Next time we come back to the book of Joshua, we'll be looking at chapter 21 at those cities, at the portions of land given to the Levites. And in connection with that are these cities of refuge. And so the Lord gives to his people six cities, which are Levitical cities 
devoted as cities, sanctified as cities of refuge. Three are on the east side of the Jordan, three are on the west side of the Jordan, and on both sides there's one in the north, one in the middle of the country, and one in the south of the country. And so they are spread evenly and symmetrically throughout the whole land so that they're in close proximity to each section of the country. Now, it's interesting that each of the cities of refuge are Levitical cities. Remember, the Levites have no inheritance. They're not given an allotment with the other tribes. The Lord is their inheritance. And God instead appoints cities and their suburbs throughout the land for the Levites to inhabit. So you have menaced Old Testament ministers of the gospel being spread, as it were, across the whole face of the land of Israel in these various cities in order that there would be close access to the word of God uh, for the whole country. Six, the, six of those cities are cities of refuge. Now, the thing that's striking, I think, even immediately at first pass, seeing the connection between the Levitical cities and this subgroup of cities of refuge, is this. What happens? The person that's described in this passage, which we'll explain in detail in just a second, the person who is, who's committed manslaughter and who has fled to a city of refuge is confined to the walls of that city for any given period of time until the high priest dies. What's that mean? It means that person is cut off from the public sanctuary. They have no access to Jerusalem. They have no ability to attend the feasts. They have no ability to go and participate in these public ordinances. And so what does God do in his wisdom? He makes sure that the cities of refuge are Levitical cities. Though they are cut off from Jerusalem, they're not cut off from Jerusalem's God or word. They're in places where their souls can be fed. They're in places where they can be taught the word of God and have access to that ministry in those local places, at all the ordinances that belonged to, the, to the, the local gatherings of God's people. The Lord has provided spiritually for these people. And this is at the very top of the list. This is the very front end of what we're, what we're being told. There is a spir- spiritual provision, a provision for their soul, not just the protection of their, their body. Now, it's amazing how much text is devoted in God's law to these cities of refuge. It's, they have a significance that we can't miss. I mean, you go to the passages that you need to study, or especially Numbers 35, that needs to be covered in some detail. Uh, sections like Deuteronomy 4, verses 41 to 43, um, Deuteronomy 19, the whole first section of that chapter. Um, and some others, but those are the three, three big ones. So there's significant space devoted to these cities of refuge. And basically what we have here is an asylum for those that have committed unintentional manslaughter. So let me explain this to the children. It is possible to kill a person and not be intending to murder them. So on the one hand, you can have a person who hates someone and who purposes to go out and to murder them. On the other hand, you can have a person who has no intention of doing any harm and has no uh, ill feelings or hatred toward a person and who accidentally or unintentionally does something that results in their death. So a man goes out into the woods to, to cut wood and... Uh, there's a defect in the axe that he's completely unaware of. The axe head f- slips off of the handle, flies through the air, and strikes someone in the head and instantly kills them. Well, there was no, there was, the motivation was never with the intention of killing them. So this is what we mean, children, when we speak about manslaughter. We're talking about someone who has killed someone but not with the intention of of murdering them. And so what would happen? An incident like this takes place. Someone dies at your hand. In that instance, you were given a provision. You were able 
to immediately, with speed, run to one of these cities of refuge, the one that was in your geographical location. And you would run to the city and stand in the gate and declare that you were seeking asylum in this city of refuge. And the elders would gather together and there would be uh, basically deliberation to determine, is it true that the person unintentionally killed them or is it true that they murdered them? So it would possible, of course, if you kill someone and you're a murderer, you could run to the city of refuge as well. But over the course of the, the uh, trial, if you will, to use our modern language, that would be determined. Two or three witnesses would be, have to be brought uh, to testify in the case of murder. And if it was true that you had murdered someone, you had intended to kill them, then you would be executed, summarily executed, um, because as, as a punishment for that crime. But if, on the other hand, it was proven that it was unintentional, that there was no motivation to do the person harm, then you would be received into the city of refuge. You, you would be given a place to live within the city of refuge, and you could abide there uh, for however long uh, time passed until the current high priest died. And after the death of the high priest, you would be allowed to go back to your home city, your own house and dwelling, and so on. Now, the high priest might live for a day. The, the high priest might live for 40 years. But in whatever case, that was the, that's what defined the limits of your, your time in the city of refuge. One other element has to be noted. There is this avenger of blood that's referred to. This is a kinsman, uh, the kinsman redeemer, the Goel institution, which we saw in the book of Ruth, our study there, who was appointed, a near kinsman, who was appointed to vindicate the blood of their family member. And so they had the ability, they had the opportunity to pursue the one who had killed them. And if they uh, were to, if the um, person who's in the city of refuge were to leave the city of refuge, there's no shelter. And they could be executed uh, by the avenger of blood and there would be no guilt that was upon them. The avenger of blood functioned almost as a, a vice regent of the magistrate in one way um, under that, that, that economy. And there are all sorts of things, some of which we can't get to, some of the details of which we can't get to here like we will when we're going through numbers and get to numbers 35. But they had this role, this function of avenging or redeeming, literally, the blood of the one who was slain. And so there's this asylum, these cities of, of refuge. A person who was not malicious, who did not deliberately kill someone, who, was, who did not intend to kill them, were provided for. And so notice that God's law does stoop to the motives and intentions. Outwardly, a person dies. But the intention or motivation makes all the difference in terms of the, the punishment that is allotted uh, to that person. And so here you have um, the Lord giving a supply of, of justice. A person has killed someone with their hand, but not with their heart, if you will. Now, I want you to notice a few things before we go to our second point. Notice that most of these cities of refuge uh, are placed on the top of mountains. They're placed on hills. There's something that can be seen afar off. There's something that you could identify and run to. And something, no doubt, that would give comfort to uh, the manslayer. Something that would give solace to them as they pursue the refuge that God had provided for them. Notice also the availability of God's justice. Notice the availability. God places a city in the north, in the middle section, and in the south on both sides of the Jordan. There's an availability. These are centrally located. Uh, in fact, if you go back to the law, Deuteronomy 19, verse 3, it speaks about how the roads going to and from these cities are to be established and they are to be kept up in order to enable those who are using them to make speed. 
This is God's provision, his supply of justice. There is a close location so that within a day, no matter where you are in Israel, within a day, you can make it to a city of refuge. God's provision. I'll also have you notice the availability of God's justice to all. In verse 9, it speaks of the sojourner. And this is true in all of the law. The Lord provided an equality of justice. The Lord looked upon the stranger and sojourner with mercy. And there wasn't a two-tier system. If you were visiting, if you were a stranger, if you were an alien, if you were a foreigner, you were afforded the same justice as someone who had been born there and lived as an Israelite for generations. The same standard of justice. God's justice and his standard of justice is applied to all. Very different, for example, from the Roman Empire, where certain perks were given to citizens and withheld from those who didn't have uh, those, those perks. And so there's the availability of this supply of God's justice, the Lord showing mercy uh, to, to all. In terms of application, let me note a couple things here. If the promised land is a picture of heaven, and it is, what do we find? We find that as the people reach the land, they not only are given rest, but they're given refuge. And this is, there's something in this, I think, for us as Christians. Heaven is a Sabbath rest. Heaven will be rest for us, rest from sin, rest from our labor, rest from sorrow, and so on. But heaven not only brings us rest, it brings us refuge. It is an eternal abode of refuge, of safety, of quiet conscience, quiet soul, as well as quiet circumstances before the Lord. The second thing that I would say is that God, who himself is a refuge, makes himself at hand. The Lord places himself, as it were, at hand. He is an ever-present help and refuge for his people. And so for the Christian, we have access. So we look into the face of temptation, and we're being enticed, and the bait is being given to us. And all of the glitter and allurements of sin are being placed before us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that in the midst of trouble, the Lord provides a way. In the midst of temptation, the Lord provides a way of escape for his people. He is a refuge at hand under the assaults of temptation towards sin. The same can be said in terms of sorrow. In all of the acute and chronic afflictions that we face, the Lord is not far off. He is a safe, he is a place of safety for our, our sorrowful souls. Wherever we find our sorrowful self, the Lord will take us and shield us. And then really attached to this, this in terms of God being a refuge at hand, we will suffer in this world injustice. If you think to yourself, I can only be at rest, if I can only be at peace, I can only cope if I get justice, then you are to be pitied as above all men miserable because you're not going to find it. You're not going to have it. You're seeking something in the wrong place. There is a lot in our life that we have to leave to the last day. Okay? Christian, listen to me. There are a lot of things in your life that you have to leave with the Lord until the last day. If you don't learn that lesson early, you will be unnecessarily afflicted. Because the Lord himself is the one where we will find a refuge of justice. And so there's a quiet submission and acquiescence and yielding to the Lord and a willingness to leave certain things with him that are beyond our ability or reach. Secondly, we have the standard of justice. 
Secondly, we have the standard of justice. The thing I think that is most pronounced about this city of refuge is how it underlines the sanctity of human life. The Lord puts a very, 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 very high premium on the sanctity, the preciousness of human life. This is disregarded, this is degraded in our culture, sadly. But the Lord, his standard of justice, says that life is precious. And this is seen in a couple ways. It's seen with regards to the manslayer's life. Okay, the fellow who has unintentionally killed someone, his life is precious. And therefore, his life should be protected. Roads are built, cities of refuge are provided, wise counsel and elders are given, and a provision of just judgment is afforded to him so that he can be protected, so that his life is not unduly killed, taken away. But that's not all. The dead man's life is precious to the Lord. The dead man's life is precious to the Lord as well. We're going to flesh this out in more detail in just a second. But one of the things that you'll see is the man who goes to the city of refuge finds a refuge. He also finds exile. He has been exiled away from his home. In other words, it's come with a cost. He doesn't have his land, his house, his normal circumstances, his city, his cronies, his family, his whatever, his normal life. He, he doesn't have that. He now has, I mean, his, some of his family probably moves with him to the city of refuge, but he has, he's living, in a sense, as a temporary alien within a city of, of refuge. And what, you know, we're, we're kind of one of the difficult things about this city of refuge is, is what I'm putting my finger on here, and it's important, as you'll see in a moment. Um, it's not cost-free. Manslaughter is not cost-free. There's a refuge, his life is protected, but it still comes with a cost. There's a costliness, and it's as if the Lord would underline for us that destroying human life is serious business with God, far more than we understand or give it credit to, give credit to. There's a preciousness in human life, and even if it is unintentional, there's a cost because this life, which was, we refer to it as the loss of innocent life. We don't mean by innocent that they were sinless, but we mean they were not guilty of some crime for which they ought to have been punished. The loss of innocent life, even when unintentional, <clears throat> is precious to the Lord and comes with a cost. It's interesting that if, um, if they died in the city of refuge before the high priest died. They would be temporarily buried there, but then their bones would be transferred after the high priest died back to their own abode. This is their inheritance. They don't lose their, their inheritance. They are still buried with their fathers in the inheritance that the Lord had given to them. So they're buried in the city of refuge and then transferred after the death of a high priest back to their, their own slayer. And so there's a standard, there's a standard of, of justice. The fact is that these cities were set apart. They were sanctified, as we see uh, in verse 7. They're appointed uh, by uh, the Lord just as the Lord Jesus Christ himself is sanctified or appointed or set apart as the refuge of his people, the one to whom we will, will run. In Hebrews, this comes out uh, in, verse, in chapter 6. It speaks about the, the precious promises that God has uh, given to us through faith and patience. We inherit uh, these promises, and that is connected to the refuge and strong consolation and hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the standard of justice is not arbitrary. 
It is not uh, something that can be adjusted. It is fixed. It reflects God's own character, as we saw this morning. It reflects the holiness of God, and that includes the the sanctity of, of human life. We probably do not think to thank the Lord that we have been kept in God's providence from slaying, even unintentionally, someone on accident. That's a mercy. You know, I, I in thinking in my, my study this week, do you know how many occasions I could have been one who did something that resulted in the death of another person? I mean, I started going back through the catalog. I may have a longer list than many, but there are a lot of instances in which that sort of thing could happen. And we ought to be thanking the Lord for sparing us where he has spared us uh, from such a thing. Thirdly, and this is where I want to f- focus especially, is the satisfaction of justice. The satisfaction of justice. You have this office of the avenger of blood, the redeemer of blood. This is a kinsman redeemer, the Goel institution, who serves to avenge the blood of one who has died. So your, your kin uh, folk die. Um, the person, of course, who killed them knows about it first. So they have a head start to get to the city of refuge. And in most every case, probably would have made it, in most cases, there uh, before the avenger of blood. But the avenger of blood may not have pursued them. He may be clear that it was unintentional and would not necessarily pursue them. Or it could be a case that he is persuaded that it was murderous and pursues them. Or he could pursue them because he doesn't know, and we could list off probably a couple other uh, possibilities. But this is the, this is the, the threat to the, to the manslayer. Here's, I think, an important point. Man is made in the image of God. And therefore, when a person is killed, something very serious is happening. Remember the words of, of uh, Genesis chapter 9. And verse 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Because man is made in the image of God, when a man is slain, when his blood is shed, that blood, we are told, pollutes the land. It defiles the land. And the only way to expunge that blood is through the blood of the murderer or the blood shedder. And so there there is no equivocation here. It is necessary that someone who has murdered someone be executed. Anything less than that is a horrific injustice before the face of God and it leaves blood that stains the land, that pollutes the nation in which it is spilt. This is what the Bible says. The only thing that wipes that away is the shedding of the blood of the one who is murdered. This is the only satisfaction of justice provided all the way back in Genesis 9 and forward, and there are no exceptions that uh, we can discover that are provided for this. This is pretty significant because in our country, we have a lot of blood to answer for, don't we? We have the blood of the unborn, over 50 million people murdered, and not a single instance that I'm aware of, not a single instance ever of just, of satisfaction of justice in their murder. Not one of those has been brought to justice. Has there been an execution of the murderer? Number two, we have murder in the streets of adults all through the land. I mean, people are murdered every single day in America without any justice, satisfactory justice. That blood 
stains the land. It defiles the land. That blood, the Bible says, cries out from the ground to God. It cries out testifying against us. And it provokes the divine indignation of the Almighty himself. Well, all of that you know, all of that you've thought of and heard and you know, reflected on, discussed before. What comes out in this passage that is, um, I think, striking to me is that when, some, when, there, when there's manslaughter, innocent life is being taken away, and there's a sense in which the blood still pollutes the ground in a different way, but there's still some, something of the blood polluting the land. In either way, there's blood that is polluting the land. Because it's interesting that the Lord says, in the case of murder in the law, no ransom is to be taken. There were capital crimes that could be capital, but did not have to be capital. And even, even um, you see, for example, with this, so with murder, nothing. You can't pay, you can't do anything else in order to expunge the guilt. What's interesting is the same, is being, the same standards being used for manslaughter. So without going into a whole lot of detail, if you look back at, at Numbers 35, one of those passages I referred to, in verse 32, it says, and ye shall take no satisfaction for him that has fled to the city of refuge. In other words, there's no alteration. There's nothing else that can be given or provided, no ransom that can be provided for him. It says that he should come again to dwell in the land until the death of the priest. So the guy who commits manslaughter has to stay in the city of refuge and there's no other options. There's no adjustment of that arrangement, no ransom. He cannot return to his city, the text says, no satisfaction given until the high priest dies. And so there's a, there's a sense in which both, in both cases, the blood pollutes the land, though not the same guilt. Both still require a measure of atonement. In the case of murder, the murderer has to die. In the case of manslaughter, the high priest has to die. It's interesting, the emphasis that is placed on the necessity of staying in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. And I scratch my head and scratch my head, what is going on? What is the deal here? Why is that emphasized so much? Why is it that uh, the requirement of the death of the high priest is there? You know, is this the public figure and his death will be, have such a, an impact on the whole community that it will somehow... Um, erase the emotion of the death of this other person, or, I mean, none of that adds up. None of that is compelling at all. I think what's compelling, especially as we begin to connect the dots with the New Testament, is that there is a sense in which the death of the high priest, his blood was atoning for that of the, the manslayer. And this then points us forward to who? that only Christ is our refuge, but to our high priest who would offer himself on behalf of, of his people. You know, one thinks of his sympathetic intercession for us in places like Hebrews 2, verse 17, therefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now, we're not saying that the, the person guilty of manslaughter is guilty of a crime or, you know, a sin. But we're saying that God places such sanctity, preciousness on human life that there's still a cost that is in, involved. And one can imagine how the Israelite would have taken great caution as far as was reasonable to protect innocent life. And so they would not have just been mindlessly careless. There would have been measures taken to ensure the protection of human life. And so the idea of driving recklessly and really not caring is a serious problem. I mean, serious, serious problem 
biblically at a number of levels. We need to prize uh, human life. There was no ransom that could be given, no exchange for this, for the murderer or for the manslaughter. No release without the death of the high priest, as you see in verse 6. And so if you go back and look at Numbers 35, verses 31 to 34, and compare it with our text in verse 6, I'll just read that again. He shall dwell in that city until he stand before the congregation for judgment and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days. Then shall the slayer return and come into his own city and unto his own house and unto the city from whence he fled. I think there's, some, I think there's something very compelling about the connection between the death of the high priest and, if you will, the sense of accounting for the innocent blood which has been shed, all of which not only underlines satisfaction of justice, but also underlines, again, the sanctity of, of human life. But ultimately, we need to turn our thoughts to what this, this was intended to shout in the faces of, of these Old Testament believers. Because as they reflected on the provision, the refuge of justice, as they reflected on the satisfaction that had to be made uh, for justice, it was obvious, it would have been evident to them that this pointed to something far greater, something far bigger, namely uh, the coming of the Messiah himself. In Ephesians 2, verse 13, but now is Christ Jesus, ye whom sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are brought nigh into this refuge through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or as you see in, in Romans uh, chapter 8, and verses 1 and 2, therefore, uh, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and of death. The fact is that we stand in need of a divine refuge. We stand in need of satisfaction because every last one of us are guilty of sin, which results in spiritual and eternal execution. There is the torment of hell. That is just. That is equitable. That is fair. If we were to receive what is fair, we would receive for any one of our singular sins the eternal indignation of a holy God. But are we not rejoicing this afternoon that we do not get what is fair? That God is both just and the justifier of the ungodly. That he has provided his son as the satisfaction. Our high priest offered himself as the sacrifice on behalf of his people. And justice was meted out upon him in order that we in him might have life and life eternal to his glory. Let's stand together for prayer. Our Lord and our God, we are thankful that you are our refuge and our strength and a very present help in trouble to your people. We are thankful for divine satisfaction, for Christ offering himself as a surety in the place of his people. We are thankful that he is a mighty savior of sinners, that his blood has been shed and that it cries out in answer to your justice and that you, O Lord, are pleased that you have been appeased, that your wrath has been quelled, that we are made acceptable in him, and that we are free in Christ Jesus. You have given to us life and an inheritance in heaven itself. Grant unto us, we ask, a, a believing, an earnest exercise of faith, and running into Christ, 
hiding in him as a refuge and under his shed blood to shield us from the wrath to come. And grant, O Lord, that you would call us forward in faith and grace to your own glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 17, verses 5 to 9. Psalm 17, verses 5 to 9, to the tune Ferent, which is number 61. Tune number 61. Look at verses 7 and following. The wondrous loving kindness show... Thou that by thy right hand savest them that trust in thee from those that up against them stand. As the apple of the eye me keep in thy wings, shade me close from lewd oppressors, compassing me round as deadly foes. Let's sing verses 5 to 9. for the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.